right? All right. Hey, welcome everyone. I'm Pete Meyer, technical editor from Motor Age Magazine, and my co-conspirator in crime tonight is... I'm Gene Crowley from <laughs> TST. Uh, welcome to tonight's webcast. Uh, again, this is our fourth and final webinar for 2013. Wow, but, uh, it flies by. It does, but it's certainly not the last. Uh, again, thanks much to the support of you guys and gals who come out and, and watch with us. Uh, tonight's webinar is Electrical Testing Techniques You Need to Know. All right. And Pete, with this subject, you know, since everything on today's vehicle is so electrified, right. we need really to know the good basic test how to use them, how to read a wiring diagram, some of the stuff we're going over tonight. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I guess what we should start too when we're talking about electrical testing, you know, you've heard us say many times in the past in the, in the webinars that we've done before, if you want to be successful at diagnosing anything, whether it's drivability issues, electrical issues, or just noise and ride complaints, the more you understand about how a system operates, the better off you are. That's no different. If anything, it's the most important factor when it comes to electrical troubleshooting. No right. doubt. No doubt. Electrical troubleshooting, you need to be an ace in this. You need to know what to do, have that game plan, and not second-guess yourself. Follow a right. clear path in diagnosis. Right. So all the simple rules that apply to any troubleshooting situation certainly apply to electrical troubleshooting. I guess another point I want to make sure that we make, we may be covering some what many of you may consider as fundamentals. But I want to say this, if you find yourself second-guessing yourself over these fundamentals while you're tackling a troubleshooting problem or a tough electrical problem, then you don't know them well enough yet. Exactly. And yeah. since there's no real standard in our industry, plenty of guys just got into the business and gals got into the business without getting a good background in electronics. It's the most important thing that you need out there. That meter, you should know everything on the meter and how to use it. Right. Okay, and we'll, we'll talk about some of that tonight on what you need to do to check some circuits out. Right. And do you have to be an electrical engineer to be successful at troubleshooting electrical problems? Nah. No, not at all. You can handle about 99% of the stuff that comes through your door on a routine basis if you have a good handle and a good solid foundation in understanding how electrical circuits work, uh, how to read a wiring diagram, and how to use your, your digital multimeter. Yeah, there's a lot of nice other tools that you can use when you're you know, getting more comfortable. You know, amp clamps, lab scopes, a lot of these are great tr tools for but speeding it all up starts, that process. It all starts yeah, right there. You've got to know how to use that. And again, for a lot of the problems that we have when a circuit is not working properly, you're going to have to do, going back to one of our old webcasts, voltage drops. And if you don't have a good meter or know how to do it, well, guess what? You're not going to see that potential difference in that circuit. And right. that could be the whole fix. Right. And let's start with something that most... Everyone, I'm sure, has seen yeah. this little triangle. And they hate it. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Some of you may have seen the, the V uh, replaced with an E. Yeah. Um, and to those, if you don't know what this is, this is a representation of Ohm's Law. Oh, I thought it right? was something uh, out in Saudi Arabia or in Egypt. I thought it was a pyramid. <laughs> yeah, what is that? Yeah, what was that? That old uh, game show, right? You know, the $1,000 pyramid. Yeah, the pyramid, it that's it. <laughs> You know, and I'll take, uh, I'll take how many slices? V for one million, right? Yeah. <laughs> I can answer that question, voltage. <laughs> and I know a lot of you are probably shaking your heads going like, oh, this can be a discussion about Ohm's Law. No, not really. I don't really care if you know how to do the math. There's been maybe one or two occasions where I've used it to figure out a missing value, but not, not very often. Right. What I want and what G wants to get across to you tonight is what this represents, the relationship between these three basic elements that you have to be comfortable with when you're facing a diagnostic or troubleshooting right. challenge that's electrical. Right, because we usually with voltage are dealing with system voltage, 12, 14, whatever volts. Resistance, when resistance goes down, that can be a big problem for you, or when it goes up. Either sure. way, resistance is going to affect amperage, and that's what we're going to be talking about here. Absolutely. So let's start with the, those basic elements. Okay, what is voltage? What is the concept of voltage? Well, don't want to get real scientific, but there's no electricity unless there's electron movement. In fact, if I recall correctly, the definition for electricity is the movement of electrons in one direction. Correct. Okay, now that's DC, one direction, but so is AC, only it alternates. Exactly, First one, then back the other. and forth. Okay, 
And simply put, voltage is pressure. And you need that voltage pressure that we measure with a meter. So right. 12 volts or 5 volts or whatever voltage you happen to be dealing with. Very, Absolutely. very important. Yeah, and, and I mean, voltage is that force that you have to, to apply in order to get these electrons to want to go somewhere. Exactly. They're not going to do it on their own. They need a push. Yep. Okay, so yeah. that's the force that we're talking about. You need some sort of a load for it to go to, right? Absolutely. Amperage. Amperage is the measurement of that electron movement, or what we call all the time, you'll hear us say several times tonight, current flow. Right. And without amperage, you know, a lot of guys will go, oh, the starter has 12 volts, it's got to be good. If you get it, without amperage, amperage shows you work in a circuit. And very, very important to measure amperage. No amperage, something's not working. Yeah, and I think that's probably one of the key things that I wanted to get across tonight to everybody who's watching. Current is what makes everything on the car work. No doubt. Right? If there's something that influences the amount of current getting to the device that we're trying to operate, and I don't care if it's the headlight, uh, the powertrain control module, um, the, the electronic steering box. If it's not getting the current that it needs to function properly, then it's not going to work right. It may work slow. It may work not at all. Not at all. The dim lights that you see driving down the road sometimes, many times a bad ground or possibly a blown fuse, right? Mm -hmm. You're not getting current to that particular load or the right amount of current. Then, of course, that fan motor, that light, whatever, cannot work to its optimum performance, correct? Yeah, absolutely. So amperage is something that you really need to look at. Too much will take a computer out, too little will not make a component work right. Right, absolutely. And it's all caused by when we have less amperage, it goes back again to voltage drop. You know, an injector roughly needs about six to 700 milliamps to overcome the fuel pressure to get that pintle up and going, okay? Without that, you're in trouble. So make sure you got good connections. Yeah. And before we get any further, I, I have to apologize. I kind of skipped over what I should have covered in the beginning. Again, if you're watching on the link that was provided in your registration, you're watching at the MotorAge site or the searchautoparts.com site, um, and you're going to see a comment section just below the player. Uh, you do have to sign in, but you can use Facebook, Google, Twitter, or just sign in for tonight using the instructions provided to offer your comments and questions. You can also do it on Twitter if you wish, over on the left, no, right hand side of the player, okay, as, uh, as you're facing it, um, is a Twitter box, and make sure you add that little hashtag though, capital M-A-T webinar, in order for it to show up in the feed so that we hear your question. Feel free to ask anytime or offer comments anytime during the course of the webinar tonight. Um, we have the lovely Ms. Doreen taking care of the camera angles for us. And uh, TST's Vice President, Pierre Respo back there monitoring the boards and, and he'll answer what he can and forward the other questions on to us, okay? So sorry for the momentary interruption in what we were talking about. Mm. Back to the board. And the final one, resistance. Resistance. And so resistance, there's some normal. In fact, every device that does work on the car, again, whether it's a light bulb or an injector or Better PCM, have resistance. It is the resistance, <laughs> right? That is, that should be the resistance in the circuit. That's what Love determines that. the current flow for that device, right? So with the, with the voltage supplied. So anything else outside of that is going to impact that current flow. Right, is unwanted resistance that could prevent that current from flowing again right. to that fan going as fast as it can go the light being as bright as it can be. So resistance can become a big problem. And what I don't want you to get trapped in, in the mindset of thinking of resistance just in terms of opposition to flow, like uh, the corrosion you see building up on a battery post or a loose connection, anything, anything that affects the, the quality of the circuit path is a resistance. If the circuit's open, that's a resistance. You know, if there's... This um, happens to be a very big one. Very big one, right? <laughs> and if there's, if there's something uh, like corrosion buildup in a connection, that's a resistance. So think in those terms. Anything that's affecting current flow is caused by some type of resistance, and we can find that resistance in the test exactly. that we'll show you. Okay. And how many times when we have a wire connection that's going in, a male and female, and the drag test, the drag test is putting a pin in there, it shouldn't just slide out. Right. We want some drag on it. And right. that would be a resistance problem. Right. And there's plenty of them out there on the vehicles that we work on that have problems at connection points. Sure, sure. Right. And depending on where you live, I mean, these, some of these harnesses, connectors are laying underneath the car in the engine compartment. They're exposed to the elements, the rust, the salt, 
you know, all of these factors right. can have uh, a play in, in the and resistance. And when the someone pierces a wire, there goes another problem. Oh, yeah. Because what's going to happen? They may pierce it down this far on the wire, and maybe you don't see it, but we're going to start getting resistance right from that spot. Corrosion's sure. going to build up, oxidation, and then guess what? The yep. component can't work as designed. Absolutely. And that's probably one of the biggest problems you see out, out there on the... Uh, yeah. The vehicles that we're working on. And there's much, many more factors that affect resistance that we can name. Now, let me see if I can paint a little picture in your mind of what we're talking about and how these three interact, okay? I got grandkids. And Same God, way. Jesus, I mean, I'm getting that. Oh, but yes, I have grandkids. <laughs> and when the They're weather's great. hot down in Florida, we like to let them play in the sprinklers. So we lay the sprinkler out there at the end of the garden hose. We turn the hose full blast so there's no resistance. There's no resistance to flow, restriction to flow with the water faucet. The only one it is is in the sprinkler. Right. And Just they're having like, a yeah. blast, right? The sprinkler's going off, they're having a great time. But if I go back to that faucet Plus. and close it off halfway, now I've added a resistance to flow, haven't I? I've restricted the flow. And what happens at the sprinkler end? It's down. It's, it's way lower. down, right? So, and then the kids aren't having as much fun. Same then they become the a little bit of a nuisance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they're grandkids. I can send them home. That's right. That's always the good part. <laughs> but they're fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so it, try to keep that in mind when you're looking at these circuits. All three of these are interrelated. You can't have one without the other. Exactly. But if there's something wrong with electrical circuit on the car, it's because the current flow to the load is not what it's supposed to be. And that's what we need to find out the cause. And again, near the end of the, the, the second third or third third or... Later on, later, later on, we'll show you how you can test for that very easily. Here's a few other things that you need to understand about these relationships, and G's already alluded to this a little bit. For a given voltage, and we can pretty much say that for the most part, we know what the voltage on the car is going to be. It's either going to be battery voltage or the charging system voltage. That's going to remain relatively constant for 99% of the problems that we're facing. Okay, What's going to change is the resistance in that circuit. And if the resistance goes up, I think like we just demonstrated, current flow goes is going to go down. And yeah. that, is, that is a key thing to remember. If the resistance goes up, and let's take a bad connection, mm -hmm. that means resistance went up. Well, of course, that particular component, whatever it is, sensor, actuator, light bulb, doesn't matter. It's not going to work because we have a current flow issue. Yeah. And, yeah. and Jay, what if the circuit's open? Would that be resistance going up? Huge, huge okay, resistance. And what happens to current flow? None, zero. Okay, so None. it's not simply a matter of having some resistance. An open circuit is a factor of resistance and does impact current An flow. Infinite just as resistance. We here. <laughs> what about the other way around? If resistance goes down... Bird computer. Yeah, current flow goes screaming up, right? Yep. And, and what's a great example of that? Well, what if you have a short to ground before the control on a circuit, the, the kind of short that pops fuses. Isn't that a great example of what happens when resistance goes sure. down? And, and think about any type of solenoid on a car. Let's take an EVAP solenoid. You know, we have a steel bar, obviously, in there with windings around it. And let's say it has 100 windings around there. Well, that's X amount of resistance. Sure. If for some reason winding one went to winding 50 and didn't get to the end, that's half the resistance of before, Current flow goes up, and that can burn out a PCM. Yeah, yeah. So always, always, these two things right here are very important. When I teach an electrical class, this is something I try to really stress. Resistance goes up, current goes down. It's like a seesaw. Resistance goes down, current flow goes up. Yeah. We need a balance, and that's very, very important. Now, i got to ask, has anyone out there ever replaced a Ford coil arm plug for a misfire? Uh, I'm sure probably just a few. A few. Okay. <laughs> you know what causes a lot of those failures? When the spark plug gaps get so wide, it creates such a demand on the coil that the secondary winding, the laminate, as G was just pointing out, that's a coil just like the injector he was describing, it, it melts down and it shorts that winding out. So exactly. an increase in resistance, right? Or yep. excuse me, a decrease, decrease in resistance, resistance increase, increase in, in current, current flow. flow. But there's not enough collapse. Right. To and induce enough spark up. voltage. And, you know, right before they usually see that, if you look at some of those epoxy-type coils, on the side of them where the ground bar is, you start to see a orange or purple type of rainbow, or perhaps it looks like little 
little needles almost sticking out. It's yeah. like dirt, an electromagnetic field. That coil, the epoxy coil is breaking down. Why? The gap that was supposed to be like that is now like this. And there we go. We keep punching right. away. Overheating. Overheating. Yep, absolutely. So very, very good point. Here's another one you really need to make a part of your your fiber as a tech when you're chasing electrical problems. You got to know this like you know everything else of the other systems on the car. Exactly. All of the voltage, all of that push that we're applying to get those electrons moving is going to be used to overcome all of the resistance in the circuit. Now what I mean by that, if I want to turn the lights on on the Toyota that we're going to be using a little bit later on, those light bulbs are the loads. That should be the only resistance in the circuit. So I need voltage to push those electrons through those light bulbs. But once I'm done, I'm not need, I don't need to push anymore. Once they're on the other side, it's all done. Remember the sprinkler example I gave you a few minutes ago? Once that water comes shooting out of the sprinkler, do I need any pressure on it anymore? No, once it's past that resistance, it's on its own having a good old time. And let's talk about that resistance. What I always like to do is say, let's say we had a battery here and a load down here, the bulb like Pete used, okay? If we have 12 volts here or 12.6 volts going down to the load, the load, if it has no resistance on end, should be able to use up almost all of that. Right. All of that voltage, pressure, should be used up by that load. If we have resistance on the feed side or resistance on the ground side, obviously there's a problem. Right, because so, the second part of this rule, well, that was back to what I said earlier, that's my example here of having to overcome that resistance. There's a little guy pushing up the boulder up to the top of the hill. Once he gets to the top, though, he's no longer needed. Now it's going to roll on its own. Okay, this is the part that we're going to talk about next. The voltage that's applied to the circuit is going to be applied proportionally to all the resistances in the circuit. So what you was referring to here just a moment ago, if I have an unwanted source of resistance, whether it's corrosion, an open, a short, whatever the case might be, any added resistance to that circuit is going to get its fair share. So in other words, Pete, you're saying that every little resistance spot or load, mm -hmm. voltage drops at each load. Yeah. And then, and then it may not be enough, like we did a while back in that voltage drop one. If you put enough loads in the circuit, even though we started with a good source, one bulb worked good. When we started adding more and more resistance, even though they were equal resistance, it got dimmer and dimmer and dimmer until the circuit didn't work. Yeah. Too much yeah. resistance. And we're going to go back to this again uh, and explain it a few more times as we go along. But let me see if you can wrap your head around this part of it. Simple lighting circuit. All you've done is, is hooked up a, a couple of wires to a battery you have later in the shop and hook it up to a light bulb so the light bulb comes on. You're going to take that whole 12 volts from the battery, and yes, I know, 12.4, 12.6, okay, whatever, 12 volts. <laughs> okay, it's going to get to that light bulb. It's going to push across the resistance so the light bulb can light as bright as it's supposed to be, what it's designed to be. And once it gets past that, we don't need it anymore. It shouldn't be anything on the other side. Now, what if you take a second light bulb and you put it in series, in line, on the positive side of the first one. Now you have two equal resistances. So half that 12 volts is going to be used by the first bulb. It's going to drop it down the six after the first And only leaves light. half for the second. So what do you think the light bulb's going to do? It's going to get dim, isn't it? Okay. And by the way, we've seen a big problem when we were doing our hands-on TST testing on that circuit. It was amazing how many people did not really understand that. And we're talking professionals like yourselves in the business. Yeah, hey, I'm yeah. going to be the first one to tell you guys, I have a real passion for teaching this particular topic because I was the guy who didn't understand it. Right. I, I told this story before. I, I won't go through the whole details right now. But I was in a position where I thought I understood the concepts behind voltage drop testing and, and electrical basics fairly well until I got found in a situation where I needed those, that knowledge and found out that I knew the, the method, but I didn't understand... How the readings, it. okay, and that's what we hope to help accomplish tonight is to change that for many of you, yeah. okay? And let's take a time out right now, and a time out, not that we're going to go take a break, <laughs> but let's see if you have any questions. Pierre, any questions? Uh, no questions. Okay, well then, forget no little, what I said no about blue time bars. out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Do any blue bars for refreshing comments on the below the player? Well, 
We will continue on while Pierre is looking. He could interrupt us after we're done with something. I'll go take a quick look. Take a quick it. look. <laughs> and again, just to uh, go over what we're going to do tonight, we're going to show you something live on the vehicle Nothing here. and show you really yeah. how to use your meter. Yeah, but it should show. And a question I have for you. Yeah, it should show with this here. If we're There's looking at comments. voltage drop, what part of the meter say, uh, should you know, be selected? Check it out for me. What part of the meter should be selected? And that's right. Look at that. You guessed correctly. The millivolt part. Um, I'm going to go back here to the resistance for a moment because we talked about putting that extra bulb on the power, power side. And I think us, a lot of guys get that part. Yep. Because I don't know about you guys, but I used to tend to think that it... it Everything's the feed. Well, no, but you had to start. You started the battery. You're going to go through the load in the back. But I thought that, you know, the little electrons are like, they're trucking in one direction. It didn't matter, you know. So I figured if it got up uh, something in front of that, that it was going to affect it. But right. I didn't quite understand that if it's on the other side, on the ground side, it has the same impact. Exactly. The same effect. And the ground, as I always like saying, is the forgotten side. Because mm. people always go to the feed side, they forget the ground side. And how many times you've seen either bolts that are stripped on grounds, uh, bolts that are corroded, Stall washes that are missing. Right. Or a lot nowadays, uh, a lot of um, grounds have a little, a little hook piece that goes over to touch the body as well. So you have not only the screw going through, but when it's tight, it actually hits another spot. So whether it be a stall washer or of that style, you have to make sure you got a good, clean, tight spot for that ground. Yeah. And anything unwanted on that side is going to give everyone a problem. All right. So, how are we doing there, bud? Okay, uh, there was a couple of things here, actually. Uh, okay. Uh, Len asked, isn't that why they're triggered, they're talking about uh, protecting circuits, isn't that why they're triggered on the ground side to protect the PCM? No, uh, the question was... Uh, you know, are we referring to the coils? Coils, yes. Right, okay. Loads in general. Co yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, the question was, is what the, is, a lot of devices, you know, are controlled on the ground side by a control module, namely, where the, the question's referencing the powertrain control power module. module. Okay. You know, and is that there to protect, you know, the PCM? Um, no, because a lot of loads are now controlled on the power side. Right. You know, current flow doesn't care whether it's on the ground or the, or the power side. It, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Any other questions, Pierre? Or comments? No, there's a couple of people who said they can't read the slide. Oh, oh are, we are we in, in your way? No, I think we'll I'm get our cameraman to zoom, zoom in on there for us. We're all zoomed in there. The rest of the stuff, they weren't missing anything because it was just a big picture. Okay, so now you got the slide zoomed in? Okay, so we're going to leave the slide zoomed in here so you can see this part. We're just going to cover very quickly... You know, you look at a wiring diagram, G, and it looks, I mean, some of these are look really complicated, multiple pages long, lots of wires. Um, we always hear about most of the circuits on the car being wired in parallel or in series parallel, parallel or something. But you right. know what? When it comes to troubleshooting a given component, you can treat it just like a, a regular series circuit, right? Exactly. And, and that's what I want you guys to take a look at here. We're going to cover the basic elements that you need to be aware of. Every circuit has to have these. We talked about the first, the source. The voltage potential has to come from somewhere. Um, a fuse, the a relay, the battery be the main source. Yeah, the battery, heat, that's the source of the electromotive potential. That, that's a chemical reaction in the battery, right? That creates the voltage, the push, the pressure we need to coerce right. those little electrons to move. And those little electrons go from negative to positive, go through, and they need to come back home. Yep. Um, the next big item you want to be aware of that you, every circuit has to have, what's doing the work? Okay, whether it's a light bulb, an injector, the PCM, I don't care what it is. Any, any form of resistance is doing the work. Right, and this is, in this example, it's going to be the, the we we'll use a bulb, but that's the load. That's, that's what we, we're going to refer to as the load of the circuit. That really should be the only real resistance you have. If, right, if it's, that's the only thing designed in the circuit, if there's nothing else there, there's not a fan, there's not another bulb, that should be the only thing with resistance in that circuit. Right. But again, if we're going to troubleshoot just that bulb, I don't have to worry about the other ones, right? Because we're just going to troubleshoot the one. And, and when we're looking at this, this, this load here as the only resistance, yes, there's connectors, there's links of wiring. All of that has some resistance, but exactly. it's very, 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 very small. And by the way, it's calculated into that whole circuit because if they get into body control modules, and most companies now are using a body control module, 
that is all figured into how that circuit's going to work. All sure. the wiring, any connection, any switch, right. that's all in it. Now, it wouldn't be any need to have a circuit if we didn't have something to do the work. So now that we have a source and a load, all we really need to do is connect the two. Power coming in and ground going back, have a complete circle, a complete path, right. and the bulb will light, right? Okay, but we don't want to leave it lit all the time, do we? So we need some type of control device, and this is a switch, a relay, uh, anything at all like that. Uh, the PCM drivers that, that someone was talking about earlier, you know, these are all control devices that simply open and close, close. the path to, no. turn the, to turn that load on and off. Uh, it can be on either side, doesn't matter, because the current flow is the same anywhere in the circuit, so we, we can put it anywhere we want. And then the last element we need is some type of circuit protection. Because if that wire between the battery and the load on the positive side touches something metal uh, before it gets to that load... It should blow. It should and, blow. And be careful because there are some fuses out there yeah. that uh, are not rated at the 10 amp or 20 amp or whatever. And I have one that'll take over 50 amps but says it's only a 20 amp fuse. Yeah. So be careful buying fuses. Make sure they're good. It's supposed to protect all of this, not melt it up. Yeah, and that's kind of a, a little side note there. Those actually started, were available at Harbor Freight. A lot of people got a hold of those things. There was a recall issued, but it's still amazing how many I still find floating around. That's the Guys, one I have. if you pop open your customer's fuse box and you see, you know, they all have, the, the spade type fuses all have a white number, 10, 20, 25, whatever right. the amperage rating is. Okay, these counterfeit fuses, uh, the ones that G's referring to, they have the number embossed, but it's not white. Right. Okay. If you see something like that, that needs to go away because that, that, that's, that's a very uh, likely capability is going to damage that car's wiring right. harness. That's a good way to start a fire, burn something up. Not a good idea. So you can't get anywhere without reading a map. Right? That's true. And I, and I had to pick this particular picture. Uh, guys, you know, I, I have a son that's in the active military. I, I really believe in supporting the military. I know G does yes. and the TST crew does. Uh, for those of you who are watching that have served, thank you. We appreciate exactly. your service. Uh, so Happy is, Veterans Day that just passed. Yep, here's a little, little something for you guys. Anyway, yep. that's the next item we're going to move on. There's no questions about what we've covered so far. No. Uh, there was one comment that he wanted some hands-on, but we're getting to that. Oh, we're getting to hands-on. Okay. Let's just take this example. Here's a horn circuit. If you can, uh, got a good zoom in on that there, Ms. Doreen. Beep, beep. Oh. And, this is a different. common type of diagram you see in, in most of the more popular service information systems, a block representation you know, of the OE diagram. I think if you ripped out an OE right. diagram, you may have several pages, pages. In, in your hands. Correct. Um, and it's a few things that when you're looking at these diagrams in your shop, uh, all the power side is up towards the top of the page, and all the ground is towards the bottom. So you have, already have an idea of where that, that flow is going. Okay. And it's a good idea here with this G100, G101. All your grounds, and you could look that up in the wiring diagram as well, location right. of where these are at. Very, very important. Right. Uh, the connector numbers are, are listed here. Uh, symbols that you don't understand if you go to using that particular service information systems diagrams, there's usually an explanation. Right. What and these symbols represent, where these components are located, and so forth. Uh, but we're just going to talk about how to, to use this how to read it first. Remember, we talked about the basics for the circuit, so we want to be able to identify these elements right. in that diagram so we can effectively troubleshoot a problem. Okay. So let's go back first. Where we want to start, I don't know, a source load, I have to have those two items. The source is pretty common, so right. personally, the first thing I like to find on that schematic, no matter how complicated, is, is the, the component, load. the load that I'm having the problem with. Okay. In our case, we're going to be saying in this particular car that we're having a problem with the right side horn. Uh, it's not working. The left horn is. Uh, we have two, of course, on the car. We have those identified. Okay. Now I got to find the source. I got to find how they connect to the source. Now, like I said earlier, going up, that's going to head us back towards the power side because of the way the block diagram is loaded out. So let's go that way first. The first thing we run into is where you can see it connected. And right there in the diagram, that dotted dash means that it's located inside the under fuse block on this car. And it's telling me if I looked up the connector pinouts in the, in the serv applicable service information, I'll find out exactly where they are if I wanted to test it there. Continue going up. 
Let me back up here a second. Now I'm going into the horn relay. See this diagram symbol for a switch? Okay, that's a control device, isn't it? And, so, one, and one thing we should notice here too, if we have one horn working, one not working, well, it looks like the power flow is all controlled here. So it won't be a horn relay. Yeah, and that's a good point here, because I notice here how the two wires splice off, leading to the two right. horns. Now we could yeah. have high resistance, meaning either an open or a big corrosion. Right. We have two separate grounds, we could have ground problems. Yep. So yep. we got to see what's what. But we're going to keep on looking for that way to back to the battery. We're going to go through the switch, continue on, and now we find this, uh, another splice. Whoop, sorry. Another splice right here. Now, if you're not sure, and you see any time your, your path back to your attempt to get to the battery or the source hits that splice, follow each one until you get back to the battery. Remember, that's where we're trying to get to. If right. I come straight down while I'm going back into the relay, only this time now it's on the coil side of the relay. Exactly. Well, that's Control. going to be important, but right now I'm not worried about it. So I'm going to go up instead, and that leads me to the horn fuse, and then the number, uh, the, the annotation, hot at all times. Well, I, wife is hot at all times, <laughs> but if she heard me say that. But, but what does that mean when we're doing a schematic? Okay. In this case, hot at all times means that that fuse has battery power, whether the key's on or off. Correct. Okay. Uh, if you see something, it says hot and run. And that means it only has power when the key is in the run position. You may see hot and start. start. You may see a combination of, of positions of where it is. But now I know that I'm on the right track because if that's hot at all times, I must be heading back towards the battery. Right. All right. Now, again, you know, we're going over this, breaking it down in all these steps. But we have two components here, one not working. And we know that you had to be getting power here. The problem we need to look at is from that splice that's over here down. Yeah. Just to remind them out there. Yeah. But and this is the way to check the whole circuit. And I think what I want to stress here is you can see that G's been doing this for a long time. He's already got that, that innate second nature to start diagnosing the problem <laughs> while he's looking at the paper. Right? And, and you can do the same thing. And many of you obviously yes, do. Yes, many of you do too. But we're here to help everyone. Two other things you're going to need in your schematics is the power distribution diagram. This is, picks up where the hot at all times leaves off. Okay, I want to know where do I get to the battery? Because if both right. horns aren't working, I may need to know anywhere along that route. Right? Exactly. So I want to trace it out now. You can see that I can get all the way back to the battery. Get hot at all times. It's only going through the one fuse. All right. So that's the power distribution side. So now we have so far the load identified. We have the control device identified. We stumbled on circuit protection, right, with the fuse. And we have the path going on the positive side of the battery identified. And now we just have to add in the ground. Once I have one side done, I go back to the load and go to ground. Find again to get all the way back to the battery using the ground distribution diagram and get all the way back to the battery. If I'm dealing with an issue, who knows? Maybe I might need that information. There are going to be situations where you do need exactly. that information, right? And notice on the G100 here it says on top of rich Engine, yeah. upper this upper cross member, I think it was. Must be cross member. Yeah. So they basically tell you where the ground is where you'll have to look with the other one here on the bell housing, left side of starter. But, and this is another interesting point I want you to, to think about. This is grounded here to what? The body. Is that hooked up to the, the negative side of the battery? No. No, no. but it's, well, through the body. Through it the body. Be. And that's a very common mistake that the techs make when they're trying to troubleshoot a problem. They don't consider that they have to get a ground path all the way back to that battery and the car is one big ground. Exactly. So just you can't necessarily test something in the back of the car, check the ground at the back of the car, and expect it to be getting all the way to the front of the car. Exactly. You know? So there's, you need to know where all this is. There's many, many problems here, like on the old GMs. They went into the fender well for the light ground in the back. Sure. G402, I believe, was the ground. They shared it with the fuel pump as well. And if you see they start sharing grounds, when you put more and more of the loads on, if the devices are getting dimmer or the pump is not running fast enough, 
you're pulling on most likely a bad ground because what do they have in common? They don't all have the power feed. A fuel pump has no power feed in common with the light bulbs, Yeah. right? So you got two different sources of power like we traced out, but what was in common, G402 was a ground that they used in the fender well of the car, and that ground, if it's bad, affects 14 lights, I believe it was, and one fuel pump. So you're saying that that the more current that's being passed through that ground connection, the more it stresses that ground connection. You bet. Pulls on it more. The more any weakness in that ground connection will become apparent, right? Exactly. And that's why you always want to stress the ground, which we'll do a little later on tonight, talk about how we can even load that ground to see it's good enough. And some of you may have figured out here, one of the things I like doing, you know, we can go, is this a load? Well, we'll talk about that in a second. But any load in the circuit, whether it be horns or lights or motors, you want to see, you know, a lot of people call up the parts guy or go dial up or whatever and order a part. Stop. Do not order a part. Check the component first. And if you don't know how to read, read a, di a wiring diagram, it may even be computer controlled with so many computers on today's car, unplug the wires with the key off, check the load yourself. Try applying power and ground to the load. If the load works, the fan blows, the light goes on, you don't need a part. You're right. missing something. Right. And that's what we're showing you here. You may be missing the ground. You may be missing the power. There's unwanted resistance somewhere. Yeah, let me back that up. We'll kind of go through that a bit. If we identify these parts, we talked about earlier that we were going to go look at a bad right side horn. All right. Correct. So what I want to know is, what parts of the current path are unique to the right side horn? Very good. And as you pointed out, the only connection that, that's unique is from the splice here, the power side to the horn, and then its own individual ground. Now, we looked earlier and you saw that these are indeed two different ground points. So I'm gonna think for a minute. Well, let's see. If I check for power here, that's gonna tell me that that section of wiring is okay. And then I can check the ground side because that's unique. Maybe it's on the ground side. And we're going to show you how, again, the actual testing method, a couple of checks, you know exactly what side of the circuit has the problem and be able to track it down to the, to the root cause. Right. Okay? But we can do a lot of our troubleshooting right here on paper. Exactly. Because if, if, go ahead. Just like you said, if you know you're getting power down, you always look at what, we're, what, what the roadmap is basically doing. Power coming in, one horn working, what's it have in common? Has the power side in common? So all we would need to do is check from here, if that's good, we know we got a ground problem, or a dead component. Mm -hmm. Could be a bad component. But we're going to show you how to check both sides of them. And a lot of guys, I like looking at the wiring diagram, but going, like I said, and going right to the component. Does the component work, yes or no? If it does, the component's out of my picture. i got to see... Do I have a good ground or not? Right. The other scenario here is if this was a horn not beeping loud enough, okay, well, what we can have here is a shared power and a back feed using this ground, mm -hmm. where a lot of times on different headlight systems, you would see they use two fuses, two power feeds, but they use the common ground. And what, what could happen, it could share that ground on the other, on the other light. Right. Or, yeah, or sure, a power feed in this case. Yeah, and you'll see what appears at first to be some pretty strange stuff when you get into electrical troubleshooting. No uh, doubt. That, that you, at first doesn't make sense to you, but uh, for me, if I were dealing with this particular problem, the, even before I started diving real deep into the schematic, I'd be making the two checks we're going to show you in just a few minutes, and then looking at the schematic to figure out what's wrong. Uh, for example, if I go out and test immediately and find that, say, neither horn works, but I have power in at least one of them, well, they share the power, the right? Power. So if one's got it, the other one should have it. It should. And if right? it doesn't, then you know you got to open right from that splice going to the horn. Yeah. Or I can go back to the diagram and say, well, I don't have power there at either one. Now I'm going to focus on the elements on that side, which is why I wanted to point out here, it's in a relay. The relay has that, that coil that has to be turned on in order to make the relay work, right? The relay may be an electronic control device, a switch, right. but it's electronic, Correct. and it can be treated just like the horn circuit. 
It's got its own load, its own path to power, its own circuit protection device, its own control, the horn switch, and its own ground path. So this relay could possibly burn that fuse out? Sure. Of course. People think relays can't do that. Uh, what are we using some of the relays nowadays? Pierre, you've seen this a lot on your BMWs. Resistors and diodes. Resistors and diodes. Yeah. Yeah. That's so we uh, protect the circuit, especially on computerized stuff. Very good, Pierre. Uh, any questions there, Mr. Pierre? Uh, actually, you answered most of them. Um, there's a comment here. Remove well, shame on me. Wire and read the ground on the load. I'm not sure that's a, a... You have to put some power through it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. But thank you for the comment. Okay, just to kind of recap again, depending on the problem you're facing, consider what parts of the circuit are shared, which parts are unique to your problem. Again, if both horns aren't working, then what is unique to both horns? Exactly. You know? And that's where you want to base your diagnostics on. So and, you can take P a moment and think about that. I think you did a great job here, you know, breaking it down, <clears throat> excuse me, into little pieces for the people out there that don't understand. Some of you may be going, oh, this is real basic junk. Well, basic stuff can lead into big problems. And you need to understand the basics first before you can get on to the more complicated stuff. Absolutely. Uh, going into MotoLogic, um, color wiring diagrams they have in there, other companies as well, or simply coloring it out yourself if you don't understand stuff. Yeah, and, I, and I'll interject here for a moment. Uh, if you guys ever get a chance to catch George Menchu doing his How to Read a Schematic class, you need to, need to attend that class. That's true. Because he gives uh, a great way to help you identify what should have power, what should have ground, when, where. Uh, excellent class if excellent. you get a chance to take we, that. We've had George out for TST many times, and he's done uh, a couple of those classes, and they've been very, very good. Yeah. People really enjoy them. And if you want more on How to Read Schematics, well, G just recently penned a feature that I think oh, was in yes. October's issue was it of the magazine. I, I lose count when months. <laughs> <laughs> um, so check that out. It gives you some more explanation on it. But as you mentioned earlier, I mean, I consider myself a, a competent tech. I'm no star, you know, but, but I can't count the number of times with guys that I've worked in, in in a variety of different shops, whether it's a dealership, independent, chain, all the places that I've worked in the last 30-odd years. You know, there, there have been guys that have I've shared this information with and only to turn around and, and have them stumble on what you know, we might think of as basics. Basics. You know, these are not basics if they're not Im embedded in your fiber and you do them on autopilot, as G was doing earlier, diagnosing the problem before we even had the schematic up. Okay? Yeah. And, and for some, it may be a little harder to remember. You know, maybe you're working, uh, doing a lot of timing belts or brakes or whatever, and right. you don't really... Hone your skills in using a meter. The meter has to become an appendage to you, like your hand, and know exactly how to use that and where to go with it. Yeah. If you got to start second guessing yourself, then you need to get into a little training. Pierre's waving at us for the yeah, question. Yeah, there's a, a comment here. Uh, Paul says, next time you get a fuel pump in that's making a racket, check the ground side to see the voltage on that side. Yeah, ah. hey, yeah, hey, that's an excellent point, Paul. Let's, um, let's just I, reiterate and, that. Yeah, the, the, the question is if you're having a fuel pump that's running erratic or making noise, to check the ground, measure the voltage on the ground side. And a lot of you are going to be wondering, measure voltage on the ground side? I thought Pete and G just said there's not supposed to be any voltage on the ground side. <laughs> well, that's something that we're going to about. We're only a few minutes. In fact, here we go, right into where we're going to talk about. So great uh, what, what do you call it? The segue. 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 Yeah, great segue into our next segment uh, on voltage drop. Remember we said earlier, all the voltage in the circuit is going to be used to overcome the resistance in the circuit. Now, we went back earlier to our, our circuit diagram. That's the resistance. That's what should drop the voltage. So I should be able to measure battery voltage, source voltage going in. And with the light turned on, there should be nothing on the other side of it. Okay? Very little nothing. Yeah, we don't live in a perfect world, right. so there's always a little bit, we said, there's resistance in the switch, there's resistance in the connectors, it's going to be a little bit there that we can measure. It's like when you turn your faucet off, just a little more drip. Little out. drip, yeah, a little drip. Um, so this is where the basic testing we talked about earlier. If what we said earlier is true, that electrical problems are caused because the current is not flowing as it should be, the, the load is not receiving the amount of current it should, then we should be able to measure that. 
we should be able to measure either through current testing or with our digital multimeter doing a voltage drop test. Now, what are we measuring for? We're looking for where the drop should be. Right. And seeing we see any areas where it's not supposed uh, to be. Exactly. Right. And we're going to do it in three <clears> easy <throat> steps. Of course, you got to make sure that your source voltage is good. You know, making sure the battery is working the way it's supposed to is, is like step number one. Correct. We've already verified that on our guinea pig. We know that's good. So now all I got to do is make two tests. I'm going to measure voltage at the power side of the load. I'm going to measure on the ground side of the load. And I'm going to know right away where the problem is in that circuit. Exactly. Now, again, I want to stress this. Guys, if, if you write this down, tape it to your toolbox, because I've seen so many guys make this very simple mistake. Doing a voltage drop measurement test is a dynamic resistance test. But I need the load on? You have to have the circuit working. Okay. Voltage is not going to drop if there's no current flowing. And okay. Pete brings that up, believe me, it's a common problem that I've seen people do in classes when I do right. hands-on stuff. They think they have a voltage drop, but the load ain't on. Right. You need to have the circuit live. And why do we want to test these dynamically? Well, as G said earlier at the very beginning of the webcast, everything on the car is going electronic. Everything. Every. Any system that these guys can convert to electronic is being converted to electronic. You so bet. that's our future. And a lot of these are very low amperage circuits. It doesn't take much to throw them off. Exactly. How are you going to find that? If you want to do a static resistance measurement, we know that's called the ohms reading. Right. When you unplug everything and you measure the resistance across the terminals to see what it is. But here, let me paint another picture in your mind here. Starter cable. You're going to turn that starter over a couple hundred amps. Easy. Easy. Right? What's the resistance if you measured one end of the starter cable to the other using your ohm meter? It's going to be very long. Yeah. Probably tenth, two tenths, right? Yeah. Very small. Okay, now I want you to try this. If you have a piece of cable laying around your shop, okay, take that piece of cable, measure the resistance end to end. Write that down. Then take your die grinder and chew away about half the cable. Measure, measure the resistance again. again. I guarantee you're going to get the same measurement. And go down to one wire. Take one wire out. Measure the resistance. Now, I defy any of you to start that car with one strand of wire connected Smoke to the up. start of the battery. Okay, <laughs> that's why we want to test dynamically. That's why we're going to test the way we're going to show you. Exactly. And you've got to do it with the circuit turned on. And let me give you another example. Fuel injectors that are on a car, 12 to 15 ohms of resistance. Yeah. And this is the stuff you see in a lot of manuals that always tell you. Oh, you know, go across the resistance and it'll be 12 to 15 ohms. Now, let's say you had 12 to 15 ohms. That does not prove that that circuit could actually work. If we even have 12 volts going to it, let's say the pintle itself is, is actually bent as it's coming up or there's a problem in the armature. We could pull high current, right? Because why? We got mechanical resistance there, different than electrical resistance. Mm. Let's say for some other reason you have super high fuel pressure and there's nothing there. That amperage could go higher. Why? We have, again, mechanical pressure holding that pintle down, and it takes more current to overcome sure. that fuel pressure. Sure. So there's just different things that you should think about when you think about electricity. Pierre? A couple of comments, actually. One is uh, this one. James says, Mazda Ford electronic service diags have a flow button where you can hit the button and see the current flow through the diagram. Yes. Oh, They're not the only ones. Very nice. Uh, Mazda comment was Mazda diagrams, and thank them for that comment. In fact, we put that, I believe it was in the article, Yes. Um, that we gave a plug, and you can find that even at uh, Advance's Motologic uh, information right. source. Because Motologic is tied to the OE repair information, right. updates for the models, and I think they, they have really expanded their coverage. They've yeah. really gotten really good with that. So check that out. You can go in there and see it or go on the Mazda website yeah. and you can find the Absolutely. same exact thing. Thank you for the comment. Another one? There's another comment. A uh, common problem is uh, one, one horn is, he says shorted, but it's not really shorted. It's got too little resistance and it's pulling all the current so the other horn doesn't work right in the short yep. circuit. Yeah, well, That's, I guess it, it depends on, on you know, where in the circuit's lying. Yeah, and I, I would, yeah, absolutely. If you have a problem with one component, short. but again, we're going to show you how you can test for that very quickly. Exactly. All right. Uh, back to our, our diagram, just <coughs> kind of to cap up on our uh, voltage drop concept. Here's the source. That's the voltage coming in. Yes, I know it's negative to positive, but your meter is set po uh, positive to negative. negative. So that's how we're going to go tonight. So if I measure right here with the bulb turned on, I, again, I should be able to measure 
the same as I had in the battery, okay? If there's a significant difference, that means there's something wrong on the side of the circuit. Exactly. Okay? If that's okay, I move to the ground side. Well, the voltage should have dropped across the bulb. I shouldn't read a perfect zero because there are Some sources electron. of resistance. Yep. There's the switch, there's the connectors, there's the wire. So I'm going to measure something other than a perfect zero, but I shouldn't read anywhere near what I read the battery. I don't think right? so. So if, I, if that's significant, then that tells me the problem is on the ground side. Okay? Correct. Or, rather than having to do some of the math for ourselves, if I put one meter lead on one side of uh, positive and then the other to the positive side of the load, the meter does the math. If I start seeing a high number there, something's wrong. And that's the best voltage drop method. The other way, you were going from negative to positive or positive to negative. Yeah. Here, well, I'd, here I'd have to do the math. And if you stink at math, uh, it could be a little scary. Right. Okay? Right. If you just take your meter, positive to the most positive, negative to the next positive, you're using it as a pressure gauge, voltage pressure, to see what it is. And by the way, would it hurt it if we take today's meter and we reverse the leads, negative up top, positive to the load? Of course not. No, no. Just get a negative type of reading. It's the same right. exact thing. Absolutely. Um, I do want to stress here, too, again, depending on, you, you need to know both sides because it depends, as we're going to be working on the back end of this car, a little hard for me to get that meter all the way up to the positive side of the battery at the same time, unless I make a lead. Exactly. So, which you can. Um, and we do want to stress that you want to test the entire current path. But okay. once we get into the problem, we'll show you why we're going to skip a little bit of that this evening. Okay, Correct. Because we did our diagnostics on the schematic first. Um, so now let's do the car. Okay, we've got a 2013 Toyota. The complaint is no reverse lamps. Uh, we're going to affirm the source is okay, which we've done. So now we can move to the back of the car, and we're going to actually perform these tests and talk about them as we go. So if I can get Miss Doreen to move over to our, our car here. Want me to put it in reverse? Let me go ahead and... you got to unlock me. i got to unlock the car. And... You want me to pop the trunk? Not yet. We'll go ahead and, and confirm first. As any case, you're always going to, to confirm the complaint. So we got the, uh, there's the brake light. There's some brake lights. And there you okay. should have So now we're in lights. reverse. We are testing it with the circuit on. So the key's on, the car's in reverse, parking brake yep. is set, and we have no lights. So we've confirmed the complaint. So now we can go ahead and go in and test it. So now we'll go ahead and pop the trunk. Now we've done a little bit of the prep work, moved some of the covers out of the way so that you know we'd save some time this oh, evening. Oh, come on, Pete. Cars don't come <laughs> into your shop like this. Everything taken apart. Damn, no, like no. Normally the trunk's full of about, you know, somebody's moving to college or something. Exactly. And, and you <laughs> Kills you when you're on flat rate, I tell you. <laughs> if we wanted to, to form these tests, uh, we're going to start off by um, hooking up to ground. And what we're going to do, we got a, a, a nice loop meter here. Any old multimeter will work. And we're going to start doing it the conventional way. As soon as I get them all untangled, the beauties of doing things live. Exactly. Okay. We loop around. Now, this is kind of neat. How many of you guys own a Power Pro? Well, I can't see a show of hands, but I'm sure many of you do. And that's one of the nice features with the Power Pro is that it's connected to the battery. The leads as you are reaching all the way to the back of the car. So I've got a good battery ground point right, right here. Well, maybe you do. Really? And the reason why I say maybe you do, we can go like this, put it on or off. But one of the checks I always like you to make, let's put that down, is take this extra ground lead, put it to here, and notice how this light is going to light up. That tells us we got continuity. Hopefully we can see that. The next thing I want you to do is notice that oh, we have a 8-amp uh, circuit breaker here on the side of this unit. So with this back on and the light on, many times because you have voltage drop at the battery, when you go to put your clamps on the battery, you don't have a good connection. If I don't have a good connection, I won't pop this breaker. So you hear that? Beep, beep. Mm -hmm. The breaker is now 
blown and I can't get 12 volts out of the unit anymore. Now watch, I'm gonna reset the breaker. No tricks here, we're just gonna reset the breaker and now I have a red light and 12 volts once again. So now I know this is a good ground, so I'm not measuring against the voltage drop I have already. Right, absolutely. See? So that's why I like doing this. This is something, and by the way, when you're doing something with static electricity, I use a ground strap to my ankle, and I use this power probe ground on it, because now I can use both of my hands and go all around the vehicle. Yeah, that's a good point. A lot of guys don't understand that, that, that static electricity can, sliding across some of these car seats can fry that PCM that you're trying to stick a probe in. Especially this time of year up here, it's cold in the northeast. We're not down in his, his <laughs> southeast, so nice flannel, warm weather. Flannel long johns, eh? So you're wearing some polyester type pants. Your fat ass is flying across that seat that's made of some acrylic material and the rugs, and what happens? We build up static electricity. According to SAE, when you see a spark and hear a spark, it's like 10,000 volts. Yeah. Not a lot of amperage, but enough to go and burn a component out yeah. on the computer. Yeah. Maybe not the whole computer, but just yeah, a second. Or at least put a hot spot on there that could fail a month, six months down the road. So now that I interrupted Pete in his track, I apologize, but now <laughs> we could basically know we got a good ground. Yeah, and again, because we're testing the entire circuit path all the way back to the battery now on both sides of the load, right? So now we can go ahead and take our meter and let's, again, we'll just start with, with this one. And if I get Doreen to kind of focus in on our meter. And, and maybe before Pete stabs that, we should baseline the meter first to make sure we do have a good connection. So we should have 12 volts on that meter. Yep, reading 12.32. So now all your leads, because the reason why I say that, you know how many of these jacks have sometimes cracked, no matter what brand it is, or right. people got dirt in there, or the wire, the insulation was good, but the wire was broken inside? If your meter leads are bad, your tests are going to be bad. Right. right. So always baseline your equipment. Absolutely. Good point. Good point. All right, so the very first test I'm going to make, we verified the source. Second one on the list was to check the power side. Again, the circuit is on, so I'm just going to kind of back probe in here. And I think Doreen can see that, 12.29. That's only a few tenths difference from what we measured at the source. So let me ask you guys, is our problem on the power side of the load? And we'll give a moment to see if anyone offers their opinion. That was pretty slick. <laughs> Any comments there? <laughs> Uh, actually, he says, hey, I'm just fluffy. I guess that means it's good. Okay. <laughs> ah, very good. <laughs> All right. So the next thing, the power side's good. It's reading the same as source voltage. Whatever is causing the problem with this light's not on that side of the circuit, at least not for this lamp. So now we're going to go to the ground side of the circuit. Get in there and back probe it. And I prefer to back probe than pierce if at all possible avoid damage to the wiring. If you do absolutely have to pierce the wire, make sure that you repair it properly. The electric, a little liquid electrical tape works really well. Clear nail polish will work in a pinch. Yep, and also the 3M vulcanizing tape for tight, tight spots. Once you put it around the wire, it seals it like a tire patch. And you know what? I guess pink nail polish would work, but I don't know if you guys at the shop that would admit to having that in their toolbox. Well, we don't want to know about that stuff. Okay. <laughs> uh, so if you can see the meter, you see that we're reading a perfect zero. Perfect zero. Okay, well, we told you that there's no such thing as a perfect world. We should be reading something because there are connections and wiring and everything else to get all the way back to the battery. So what do you guys think, if I'm reading a perfect zero on the ground side, what do you think that might be trying to tell me? Hmm. Think about that. Any comments, Pierre? Can't hear Pete. Uh -oh. Can you hear me? Did he shut himself off? I'm on. He looks like looks like his sound is up. I'm sorry. Now, any question? Any comments on the, any the, takers on the question? The perfect zero. Okay, again, if, there's, if, there's, if you're doing a, a voltage drop test, we told you, you have to have the circuit on in order to get a reading. It has to be current flowing. 
if I'm reading on the ground side a perfect zero, it's like my meter isn't even touching anything, is it? There's no current flowing. There's no voltage on this side of the load. There's only one thing in between my two test points at this point because I'm testing right there at the bulb. That's another point I guess we should stress. Get as close to that load that you're trying to test as possible, as possible. so you can check the entire circuit path, okay? So that's the first thing we want to take a look at. We know that there's a problem with this bulb. This bulb must be blown. Well, this bulb isn't there. No wonder why you had zero. I wonder why we had zero. <laughs> All right, so let's fix that. Put the bulb in. You see that, of course, it's working. Nice and bright. And now it's so bright I can't see the hole. There we go. So now that he's putting that in, what happens if he back probes the ground side now? And another question, is the meter in the best possible selection to give us the best reading? Yep. Now let's, uh, let's go ahead and talk about that first. We'll go ahead to the uh, meter lead. Going to go back to the power side, check that again. 11.6. Oh, I guess you're not leaving tonight. By the time <laughs> we're over, the battery will be dead. <laughs> right? And then we come to the other side, check the ground side. Yep, we have something okay, Now there. we got a reading, a 0 0.09. Yep. Not much, but again, that's the rest of the resistance is the little ones that we expect to be there. All right. And if you switch that meter to millivolts on that same ground side, And go right now, the back. reason that G, and, and, and the reason that you likes this side using the, the millivolts, if you're going to go positive to positive, okay, we, we had to do the math right on our positive test just now, yep. or negative to negative, like we're going to do here on the ground side, because that meter is set to what about a three or four hundred millivolt cap, right? right. In, in this case, this, in this new case, Fluke 88, it's a 600 millivolt cap. So there's the 87.9. It rounded it out before to 90 right. millivolts. You got an 87.9 voltage drop from the ground cable, per se, because we're at the battery ground with the power probe, to this light bulb. That's very acceptable. All right, so that's good. Now, how about doing the feed side uh, voltage drop, Pete? Just for the hell of it. I'll hold the tip on for you if you'll just move over there. All right. And all we're going to do is take advantage of the power probe's tip. Ooh. Uh, we're going to uh, give me... Uh, the wire, you can back probe. I can, I can go like this. I'm going to take the black lead, go to the tip of the power probe. I'm going to put the power probe on. Yeah, let me get a good. So we're checking voltage probe. potential of the power probe right to this back probe thing. And what are we reading for voltage drop? Uh, 654 millivolts. 654 millivolts. So there's some voltage drop on this side. And that would make sense because I'm reading 12.3 and before you were reading 11 something, weren't you? Right, and keep in mind that, that this is not the, the best of testing lead setups because we have resistance here. Yep. We've got resistance here, here, all these points in between. But that would be about the max I would want to see it on a conventional circuit. Right. You know, if, it, if it's working and it seems bright enough or a motor is blowing good, you know, that may be uh, okay. If something wasn't working right, that's excessive. Pierre, question. Well, first of all, uh, there were a lot of comments about bad bulb, but they came up too late for our discussion. Okay. Um, there's a comment here. Uh, we like to see under 200 millivolts. Um, um, I'm a big fan of that. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that um, as, a, as a general rule, yeah, I've seen numbers across the board, but let's say it this way. The more current that that load normally carries, the more cushion you have in voltage drop. Exactly. If so it's a starter motor, half a volt to a volt, I'm personally not going to lose too much sleep over. Right. If there's no problems. Correct. If it's spinning over properly, if everything's working properly, not going to lose too much sleep over that. If I'm dealing with a computer circuit, now I want to get down to maybe a tenth of a volt. Yeah. Max. Yeah. 100 okay. millivolts max in some cars less than that. And Pete brings a good point up. You know, General Motors, because you got to remember when they manufacture a lot of cars, and I think a couple other manufacturers or a few more, they'll allow you on a non-computer circuit 500 millivolts. Now, that's a lot. 
I'm, I'm a 200 millivolt type guy. Yeah. But again, if there's no problem, you know, with something spinning or lighting up, whatever the case may be, then we don't worry. If we have a problem, it's good to check it out. And this came up the last time we talked about voltage drop testing. Guys, and if you have experience, please chime in. It's been my personal experience that if there is a problem in voltage drop, it's not going to be a matter of a few tenths. You're right. going to see it, no question, that there's a problem there, okay? No now, doubt. We haven't verified our repair, so let's just double check here. And guess what? Ah, we got one working, but the other one's still not functioning. Oh, but isn't one good enough to go? <laughs> of course not. Oh, okay. So let's come over to this side. See if I can pop this boy off. Oh, look at that. And we're going to repeat those tests. And this time, maybe check if there's really a bulb in there. <laughs> No, I don't think I can get away with that twice. Damn. We were hoping you guys didn't notice that. All right, same thing. Going to start on the power side of the circuit. 11 volts, 11, 690 millivolts. So that's, that's damn good. So that's, that's right on the line. That's right on the line. And then we're going to go to the ground side. Whoa. Wow. Now, you got the same voltage on the ground side. Let's ask them what they think, and right away, I'll give you an example that Ford Explorer used to have a problem where the vehicle wouldn't start if you took your meter or a test light and went across the battery, okay, you would get the 12.6 volts. Now, we all know if I ground the meter to the negative post of the battery and I touch the red lead to the metal intake plenum or any ground on the motor, I shouldn't get voltage, should I? Right. Right? But what happens when I do? It's the same problem we're having here. We're getting voltage. What is that problem? Uh, it hasn't updated yet. But, it uh, will. There was a question. Any thought on ignition switch resistance? Uh, there's a, one answer so far. A few more coming up. No ground. Yeah. Okay. So those of you who are watching, very adept. We have voltage on the other side of the load, but there's no ground. ground. So the pro And how do we know that? We know that because if the circuit's complete, if current is flowing, once it crossed that bulb, that voltage should have been used up. You bet. But because it's almost all left over, that means that there's another resistance that still wants more to overcome. If it's an open circuit, well, it's going to want all of it, isn't it? And, right? and let's just take this out for a second. There's the bulb, and let me say, just like a fuel injector on a car, key on, engine off, both sides have power, don't they? Just like we have here. Mm -hmm. Both would be 12 volts, or in this case, 11 something. Right. What's always missing, just like everyone said? The ground is missing, right? The computer does the toggling of the ground. So if we apply ground to this side, this was your ground side, mm -hmm. okay? If we take the power probe and supply ground there, okay, I'm just going to touch this side right here. Okay, I just confirmed the load is good. Let's do that again. I confirm the load is good by applying ground with the power probe. Mm -hmm. I know I got a wiring issue, correct? And that's what I got to fix. And I'm just going to be the spoiler too because it's like I got voltage on the other side of the load. I know the load's good because it got through the load. Got through the load. <laughs> exactly. And then, see, now that's another good point. But if it was an open, and that's why on fuel injectors when they tell you 12 to 15 ohms of resistance, most of the time they're looking for the OEs as an open. Right. Right? Right. But that injector will have power on both sides. And a lot of people can't wrap that around their head that we need two sides of the circuit. We need to ground it. Right. And that's the same thing here. Right. And, and, and to, uh, to take that one step further, if we had measured a good result on the ground side and a good result on the positive side, it's not open like the other bulb was because Correct. that did not give us a good result on the ground side. Okay. But there was a change of resistance in that load. A shorted injector will give you a change in resistance. It will voltage drop, but the load will not be functioning as normal. So if I got good and good, good. and those two tests, I know the problem is the load. You bet. Okay. Something in the load. Very okay. good. Now, since we know the problems on the ground side, I think it's time to go back to our schematics. I do a little homework. 
Okay. You see, here's the schematic for the backup lamps on this Toyota. As you can see, I'm only, only focused on the ground side of the loads. Here are the loads. We've got those identified. And I only care about the ground side, because didn't my two tests just show me that the problem's on the ground side? And we, got, we know one light, it seems like it's a shared ground, Pete. Oh, look at that. Well, one's working. Hmm. One's not. Wow. But they, they have uh, two separate ground paths up to this splice, and then there's a shared path to ground here in the left rear of the trunk. Is everybody with me on that? And, and I think one of the reasons that I should point out for Pierre's sake, you know, there, we do have about a minute or so delay between me talking now and you hearing us, and that will account for some of the comments that we're not, we're not being mean and not answering your questions on time. It's just that we're, we're a little bit ahead of you. <laughs> That's all. Just floating ahead. <laughs> so we will treat them as they come in. But we already identified that the positive side of the circuit is good. And I know that two different ways. I know that power is coming into the light here, and I verified it on the side that's failed. So I know that's, I don't care about that side of the circuit. could care less. I'm going to focus on the ground side. And we very quickly, as you pointed out, it's unique to this splice and then shared. If one's working, is it going to be in the shared path? Can't be. It's Can't got be. to be in this section from the load to the splice. Okay. Now, the diagrams don't always accurately represent where that little splice is located. It looks like it's only a few inches away from the light. You would kind of think it's located in the trunk lid, and it might be. Could okay. be. But let's see how we're going to find out. Just for your, for your sake, so you can see what we're going to be looking at, inside the trunk, this is the common ground point. It's located uh, just under the splash shield here at the back edge of the trunk. So that's our common ground point. Here's the section that's going to be coming out of the trunk lid, hiding behind that left quarter panel, where it's coming down from the, from the trunk deck and then into the harness. And then last, here we see, we know we've got the taillight assembly on, on the left side being spliced in the harness. Maybe that's where the splice point is? Don't know. Could be. Okay, but it could be. So that's just some clues looking at what I actually have on the car as compared to the diagram. Okay, so now we can go back to the car. We'll kick that part in a minute. Over to the car. <laughs> I'll get a sip of water. Okay, now we're back to the car. Again, we're focused on the ground side of the circuit. Lights are still on. The neat thing about voltage drop is that if you know there's a problem, this case is on the ground side, all I got to do is start working my way back to the source, the battery on the ground path that we identified in the schematic. As soon as my meter reading goes back to what it's supposed to be, I know I've passed the problem. And now I can, you ever watch these guys play? You're a big baseball fan. You know, they get the guy between first and second and they start throwing the ball back and forth, trying to catch the guy in the middle. Yep. That's what we're gonna do to find this, this problem, okay? And we're gonna start right off by going straight to the body ground point that, that I showed you in the picture, measuring there. And what do we have there? 1.3. Okay. Very good reading. And by the way, just another quick tip, if you want to check, make sure grounds are real good, you could take your power probe, go to the ground on the car. You should have a green light. When you hit power to the ground, you better pop the fuse like that just happened. And now I got no power. I better reset the breaker. Because a lot of times grounds could be an issue. Yeah, and I want to be careful here because here we're, oops, sorry about that, actually going back all the way to the body ground. So that 1.3 is okay, but I want to stick with this one because this, I want to see that, that big difference there. Well, we would always see it jump to OL and then go switch down yeah. the scale. Because right at this point here, I'm, I have like nothing flowing at this point. Right. Okay. So I know the break has got to be, if that read 12 and a half and this is reading zero, Break's got to be between this point and that point. Even no at the 1.3, that might still be trace. Remember, this is not, this is a shared ground. There are other circuits flowing in here. Correct. Like the light that's on. Okay. So that returned to normal, didn't it? That it right? did. Looks okay. good. So I, I like that beeper part too. Anyway, so here's good. Now we need to start backtracking back and forth. 
The second point I'm going to check is that splice point, sus suspected splice point. Correct. That we looked at a little earlier on the do on the pictures. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and back probe in that. Oh, look at that! We got a little bit of an increase. A little bit. Okay, but still not probably where I want to be. This I'm still on a common ground path, aren't I? Yep. But that's a good reading. I want to keep going back until my meter reading goes bad again. Goes OL and we jump up. Right, because when it goes bad again, I know I've now I'm backtracking to the point where the failure actually occurred. So we're going to open up this section of the harness. And let's see if I can get in on this one. This is a white with a black tracer, just like outlined in the diagram. And whoa, you're getting uh, bouncing all over. But I'm getting a reading there, right? This is a very yeah. small wire. I'm getting a reading there. That must be the light that's working. Right. right? So let's try this, this other one. OL. Can you see that? OL, now I'm going to switch to a higher scale, even though it's going down on the meter. And uh, we don't have anything. Uh, there we go. 11 volts, 11.67. You should all know what type of problem we have. Did I pass the point where the failure occurred? Going back towards the load now. And I want to make sure everybody's with us on that. I know there's that delay, but if you have any comments or questions, I want you to get this part. Okay, we started here at, at the load that's failed. We verified that the power side of the circuit is okay because we got that full battery voltage there. Exactly. Went to the ground side, and we also read battery voltage which told us that that's the side of the circuit that had the problem. The load should be at this point is okay. All right, so now we've traced it back to the uh, ground side. We're looking for the reading returns to normal. When we checked the ground point here on the back side, the main ground, that was normal. So now I know between here and there, I have a problem. Know that. Now I start moving back. I'm waiting for my meter reading to go bad again, which we just got right here. So now I've got it narrowed down between here and here. And I go back the other way until the meter reading goes bad again. And we're just going to come down a little bit here. Okay, we got uh, 20 millivolts you had there. 0 0.020. Let's see if I can get on there. These are very small wires. There we go. Yeah, we have very little 20 millivolts. All right, so that's good, right? So now, bad, good, good, bad, bad good. good. I don't know if Mr. Rain can see that. There's our open. There's the fault. Okay. Now, if we want to go one step further and make sure we do like G does with the power probe. I don't know if you'll be able to see that if we cock that down just enough to see the light there, G, on the deck. Oh. Okay. And if we, yeah, if you could turn that, bring that down, and we'll see if they can see it. Let me know when you're ready. Yeah, okay you keep now. on coming. Good. Got it. All right, now we'll see if we can check it at the break. See if we can get anything to there. Apply ground, then it should come on. Uh, they don't give you much there nowadays. Goes. There you go. Okay. So we're on, proven that that's the problem right at that point. Well, I mean, in this case, it's pretty obvious, but where it can right. come into play is if where we were just talking about a resistance. Maybe we measured five volts yeah. on the ground side. That five volts is still a big red flag. That is not 0.3. You know, that's if, not a matter of uh, uh, under that 500 millivolts. But let's say this from the trunk lid going up and down, that the 10 strands of wire in here were broken down to two or so. Absolutely. And it was corrosion in here. Sure. That's what you'd be doing with your power probe to see, or jump a wire, doesn't matter. Right. To see if that actually works. And Could the voltage the drop, the same test we just did, you would do to find a problem. Could be, yeah. You know, the light would be dim. You know, exactly. Um, the injector wouldn't be opening. Um, Any component wouldn't be the fan. Wouldn't yeah, be blowing the, the, as good. The, whatever the motor is coming down slowly. 
you know, all these are a factor of what we talked about at the very beginning. If there's a fault electrically, it's because the current getting to that load, load. is not what it's supposed to be. And we need to find out who's interfering with that. It can be on the power side. It can be on the ground side. Correct. It can be in the load internally. But I think that you can see that in these few tests, just the two tests, we can identify where the problem lies and then use that, that baseball analogy, the back and forth between good and bad to narrow down the problem area of where it is. And don't just, you know, pick the spots that are easy to get to oh, exactly. on the harness. You know, look at the connectors first. Someone mentioned ignition switches earlier, uh, the control devices if the ground side, if they're located in the ground side. These are all areas that you'd want to check across first and, right, and they're most going. likely before you start stripping harnesses apart. And like you notice, this is a good comment, you know, trunk moving up and down, wires break. You know, door doors open and close. How many times power windows, power locks don't work right. because they, the wires keep flexing every time you but, open but and close if, it. If you guys leave with anything tonight, two tests, power side, ground side. What are the readings? Which side of the circuit has the problem? With the circuit on. And we'll come right back over here. Let me shut this off so I can drive In fact, to the, you know, while he's shutting that off, always practice, you know, Practice makes perfect. You've heard that a million times. Well, why don't you try practicing just like we did here, you know, taking a bulb out and making a, an open in the circuit. You know, put a resistor in the circuit. See what happens. See what the expected readings are. Learn how to read a di di wire and diagram. Trace it through, just like we showed you there. Did you need to go through that? Well, you guys that are experienced, obviously, just like I said, we could do this. I started diagnosing it before we went through it. But many times, we get confused. We need to get down to the very basic of tracing through that wiring diagram and right. knowing who is the, the power source, what's involved in it, is there a relay, is there a fuse, going all the way back to the battery, is it a good connection? You know, like some of the Volkswagens that burn up the fuse box because the crimp connector is bad there and things don't work. Well, you trace it all the way back, it would go right to that Volkswagen box there where the bad connection is, a voltage drop. So check both sides of the load. Very important, like Pete said. Yeah. You have the power side, but the forgotten side, again, is the ground side. Don't forget to check it. Yeah. And Comments, Pierre? Uh, yeah, there's a comment Oops, sorry. here. Most yeah. wiring diagrams will identify splice locations while the schematics do not. Very good comment. Mm -hmm. Most wiring diagrams will show you the splice locations, the G numbers, and always know, it, know the higher the number is towards the rear of the car. So if you yeah. get 101 is up front, 102 may be near the dash, 103 be in the middle, 104 should be the back of the car. Yep. Just a, a rough way to think of it. And always look at this, the symbols and the, the key, what do they call it, the wiring key or abbreviations or whatever. Right, and, and just as another quick side note here, um, in this particular case, we're checking the ground for that light bulb. In this case, up to this point, it's independent. Okay, they don't splice until well into the trunk. Okay? Right. Um, so in this case, I've got four wires here with the same color. You know, that can be confusing. If you want to know a way around it, invest in a small amp clamp. And then if you want to know which one is, not this, this light was not working, so there's no current flow. Zero. This light's working. That has current flow. So if I start wrapping my amp clamp around those wires, I see the one that doesn't have current flow, well that must be the ground wire I wanna, I wanna uh, focus on. And Tex, it's very, very inexpensive to get one of the amp clamps that have the little numbers on it. You don't need anything to hook to a lab scope or even to your meter. There's the little ones, I'm not gonna run over and get it, but it's just a little clamp and it tells you what the current flow right. actually is on it. Made by many, many different companies. Your favorite tool guy, I'm sure, would like to sell you one of them. Right. And you need it. It's a good quick checker. Um, just roll right over here real quick. Uh, there's, one two, more. there's two comments here okay. that sure. I think are pertinent. One is uh, diagnosis of electrical problems can consume a lot of time. Testing from the middle of the circuit can save time. The divide and conquer strategy. Um, yeah, that was the, the comment was that it can take a lot of time to do electrical troubleshooting, and sometimes it's, it's easier to divide the circuit in half. I would say if you're dealing with a relay circuit, that might have some merit, but I'm going to challenge each and every one of you. Put this method to work. If there's one technique that you, that you master, it should be voltage drop testing. I can go to any load on the car. I can take two tests and know immediately 
what side of the circuit has the problem, and then go from there. Then I can pull out the schematics and start working in detail. Uh, find out what's shared, what's unique in the circuits. And we have lots more resources. I realize that you know, these webinars are not that long. It's not like a, you know, a three-hour seminar you might attend at a live training event you know, where you, or a school program or something like that. But uh, one of the very first webinars that we did together was focused entirely on this testing technique. We've done so much more with it since. Check out the Motor Age YouTube channel, TST's YouTube channel, uh, of course, the AutoPro Workshop, the Motor Age site, the print issues. We have all kinds of resources there to help you. And if you need help finding them, dude, I am not hard to find. You can Facebook me, Google Plus, LinkedIn, Twitter. He's everywhere. Me. I am not hard to find. So I'll be glad to help you in any way I can. One, One other comment? comment. James says, I've always taught to test from accessible points in the harness and never pierce and replace wire between points where the problem is. Okay, one technician commented that um, he was always taught to test the connections first before starting to dive into the harness. I would certainly agree with that. Same here. You know, go to the easiest places first, but once you've located the section good and bad, you know that it's in the middle, well, then you have to start doing the, you know, back and forth until you cross exactly where the problem occurs, and yeah, you might have to get into the harness. As far as piercing the wires, if you, sometimes you just have to, and if you do, Make sure that you repair it, as we said earlier, um, the, the black liquid electrical tape, tape. works very well. If, make sure that you see Vulcanizing tape, yeah, nail tape, polish. Yeah. Not Wrapping it with electrical tape is not going to do it, guys. Okay, that will not seal it again. And be okay. careful when you do pierce, because sometimes you're right. Absolutely. You, and I'm against piercing, but every once in a blue moon, you have to pierce. Right. Is that called a Hickman or Hitchman probe? The little probes, the pin is so small, you barely can see it. Right. All that does is go through the insulation, does not break any of the strands of wire. If you get right. the big one where you see this big needle going through, or right. you shove your, your jaw. the jaw in it, forget yeah. it. You have damage to the strands of wire. Yeah. Current flow is going down. Yeah, so you know, again, absolutely avoid that if at all possible. I have a question a few people ask. What about load pro? You know, I know that there, there's been... Low I've, pro I've seen the low nice. pro, and, and there's some great information on it. Um, I, I've, I've met the man who, who came up with it. Dan Sullivan, um, yep. I, and he has some great information. So I'm certainly not going to say anything negative about it. Uh, personally, I've, I've never had the need for it because if you have a multimeter and you know how to use it, you can find the problem, as we just right. demonstrated. But if you're in situations where you're dealing with some of the stuff that, that most of his customers deal with, the heavy equipment, the caterpillars, the mining equipment, dude, you're not running a cable from the battery, you know, 80 feet back to the end of the, of the loader. <laughs> Yeah, he's basically, he has a load, the Load Pro is, is a very good tool. It has resistance built inside of it that allows you to do the voltage drop test right, right. on your meter. There's right. a scale that comes with it. Dan stuff, you know, hats off to him. It is a yeah. good tool. But yeah. Well, it's so, like when we, the old days when we used to take an open circuit and put a headlight on it. Exactly. To load the wiring, you know, and I'm just saying that you don't, you know, you don't have to do that. You, right. you, you, There's you, different methods. You, you know, guys, if it works for you, the load pro is good, the power probe is good, jumper wires are good, wiring diagrams are good. There's a whole bunch of stuff good. Yeah. But the bottom line is you need to know how to use your meter. Right. Period. Right. You need to invest in a good meter, especially nowadays with many, many electric cars and hybrid cars that are out. Get a cat free certified meter. Make sure you know how to use min max, voltage, the whole nine yards. Current flow, you should make yourself when you're doing amperage through your meter. Use a 10 amp resettable circuit breaker in series. That way you don't burn the fuses out inside. Right. And again, there's a lot of tools that are out there that can help make your life easier and help improve your efficiency. But I know everybody who's watching tonight, you got a meter in your toolbox. I like to think that you have a meter, at least that, in your toolbox. Blow the dust off. Yeah. Another question, uh, one comment. One last uh, uh, question, really. Uh, can you give an example of how components can backfeed into each other when there's a problem? Well, if a component is good, let's say we have a common ground and two loads. So here's my common ground. Here's the two loads, okay? If we have separate feeds to both of these, okay, what could happen, oh, peace, oh yeah. I never, I'm not a crook, that's right. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, wasn't even, I didn't even notice that. But the set. This, the, the ground that's in common, we could backfeed from the power in this load going in. I've found many of cars, like Toyota headlight circuit, the Saturn headlight circuit, 
that have two fuses, one for each side, but they use a common ground. So you'll see one headlight that looks bright and the other one's dim. It'll back feed right into the other circuit. Yeah. Because it, it has something in common, right? A, a current's going to take the path of least resistance. It's like water. Right? So if you have a bad ground and there's a second device for it to go through to get the ground, it's going gonna, it's gonna to follow that path. Exactly. Yeah. So, but two tests, one power side, one ground side, you're going to know which side has the issue. Kick. Okay. Any other? Uh, no, that's pretty much it. Good. Okay, Good. I want to leave this information with you. I think Ms. Doreen has it zoomed in on the screen there. Just a few notes for you. If you're doing power side to power side and you get a reading that's greater than half a volt, that's where the problem lies, on the power side of the circuit. Yes, as we stated earlier, computer side, one-tenth. These guys like two-tenths. You know, depending on the amount the of current. The non-computer side. The, the, yeah, the computer, <laughs> yeah. The amount of current passing through it is going to be a factor. Right. Same thing on the ground side, ground side of the source, ground side of the load. If the reading's greater than half a volt, like in our case, 12, it was the same as the battery voltage, okay? Your problem's on the negative side of the circuit. Yep. If you don't read anything but a perfect zero on the power side, well, guess what? There's an open circuit or it's not turned on. Okay. The load is not being used. Okay. Negative side, you get a perfect zero, perfect zero, problem is in the load, it's an open in the load, or again, the circuit's not turned on. Yep. And the last one is the example that we had this evening. If the negative side is the same side as the positive side, well, then there's an open in the ground side. And I think that's where you're gonna find 80% of your issues is on the ground side of the circuit. So this is a good, quick cheat sheet. You may wanna change the 0.5 to 0.2 for you guys that said that. I'm like one of those guys, but yep. use this. This is five easy things to help you diagnose yep. if something's bad. And that's the thing with voltage drop. Any one of you can do what we did in terms of where to put the leads, but you make what the meter's trying to tell you, you make that instinctive so you don't have to think about it. You know what it's saying. You learn the language, and you're going to find your electrical troubleshooting difficulties over. No doubt. And we had questions. Uh, real quick mention, um, if you're familiar with Powertrain Pro on Motor Age, that's Wayne Colonna of the Automatic Transmission Service Group. He's probably the man when it comes to, to he automatic is the man. trainees. ATSG. And he, we will be hosting a general transmission diagnostic webinar in just a few weeks, December 5th, uh, 2013, at 8 p.m. Eastern. You can register at motorage.com forward slash PTP Diagnostics. Uh, or just keep an eye on the Certified Technician Newsletter. Uh, motorrace.com forward slash four text just like you learned about tonight's webinar you'll learn about the the, the uh, information on that and well. also i want to give wayne uh, another plug there with atsg to have a good hotline not only for tranny shops but we did something transibility meets drivability yeah. and guess what a lot of us that work in the non-transmission sector could have problems with a transmission causing a drivability issue right so they also take hotline calls at ATSG, Jim Dial and crew, along with Wayne, obviously will be more than glad to answer your questions. Yeah. So. And, and a lot of that webinar is going to be on that. You know, is it the transmission or is it the engine? Is there something else causing that? that Make sure that you point? tune in and check that out. And again, it's, it, and it's <coughs> free. What can I, well, hey, what can I Free, what a deal. I'm going to sign on. And then we got to give G a chance uh, to earn his living. I mean, hey, I want you guys to know that the, that the folks here, Doreen Pierre, uh, Doreen Pierre and gee, you know, they're all doing this on their own time and their own dime. You know, they're not compensated in any way for helping us to bring this, this information and training to you to use their facility up here in New York. Uh, so got to give G a chance to tell you what he does for a living, <laughs> running uh, automatic. You mean, you mean where I can pay my bills from? <laughs> <laughs> I do training classes, a whole bunch of different training classes if you're interested. Do them all over the place, not only here in the training center, but anywhere. And we do have another hands-on hybrid class coming up in January 2014. If you're interested, you can always email me at gt at attstraining.com. Thank you. And addition, dun, 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 four things TST are coming up stuff. from the TST side. So upcoming seminars, simulcast and webcast. Tuesday, next week, November 26th at 8 p.m. TST on vehicle roundtable. We change it up the format a little bit. We go out on a car. You may have seen our last one. Our camera guy was a little shaky, but We'll break his legs this time so he won't be able to move around as much or get Doreen back. So uh, please tune in for that. 
<laughs> we also have my buddy Bill Fulton coming up doing diagnostic strategies on broken cars, symptoms to symptom-based diagnostics beyond patent failures. That's a long one. And that's January 13th to the 16th, Massachusetts on the 13th, and we're in uh, Tuesday, South Barry, Connecticut, Toto in New Jersey on the 15th, and here in Mayapak, New York on the 16th, and simulcast that same night all over the world. March the 22nd. Well, first of all, we have a, uh, a full day for you up there. We feed you breakfast, lunch, and snacks through the day. But we have three great instructors, and this man will be doing another keynote speech. Go check out some of his stuff on our YouTube channel. But we have three instructors. Oh, my buddy Wayne Colonna, Drivability and Transmission Tips. Paul Scanadana, and check out Paul's uh, YouTube channel as well, No Start Diagnosis. And Scott Brown, my other buddy, what's new and what's coming on IATN? And if you're a damn IATN member, you better come out to meet this guy because <laughs> you won't get a chance if you uh, live elsewhere. The other thing, we have a call for tools and equipment or other neat stuff for our Technician's Choice Award. We already have some neat stuff picked out, things that are helpful to technicians in the field and shop owners as well. So this is not only saying for you guys that know something neat, some uh, companies out there, maybe you have a new tool out, like uh, who knows, it could be a scan tool, it could be a simple uh, tool. We know from Star Environmental has some neat thing. Another company uh, had a very simple thing that you could fill any hole up with an airbag type of bladder thing. So we have quite a few different things we're gonna be showing you that meet our top 10 uh, or top technician's choice award. So please, if you have anything, send it in. And we always like to thank Motor Age and Pete here for coming up and allowing us to share information with you. It's all about helping each other. Yeah. So I have one last call for questions before we bid you adieu. Uh, just a bunch of thank yous at this point. Okay. And thank you guys. Happy Thanksgiving to you yeah. and your families. And since we don't see them until next year, happy, happy holidays. Happy holidays. Christmas. Christmas, Hanukkah. I know Kwanzaa. that's not politically correct. Whatever. All right. But no, again, thanks to everyone who came out and spent the time with us tonight. We look forward to doing this again for you in 2014. Have a good evening. Same. Thanks.